So these are the characteristic mesothelial cells as we can appreciate. Now these mesothelial cells are present in small cluster as you can already see in this particular diagram. Okay. Now very importantly, if you see an individual uh, mesothelial cell, they are round and the nucleus is also round. And if you see the nucleus is central to eccentrically placed, it is shifted to one side. Okay. Also, one very important thing, if you can appreciate the cytoplasmic border, if you see, they are quite sharply defined, okay? And if you see the perinuclear cytoplasm, that is the cytoplasm, which is just surrounding the nucleus, they are quite dense compared to the outer pale cytoplasm, okay? Not only that, you can see certain prominent nucleoli as well. Now, sometimes within an individual mesothelial cell can show multinucleation, which is having two to three nuclei. So, multinucleation in a mesothelial cell is quite frequent and easily seen. And sometimes if you see the cytoplasm is also showing cytoplasmic blebs as we can appreciate over here. Now, one very important feature that is demonstrated by the cluster of mesothelial cells is what is known as the window phenomenon or window-like pattern. Now, what is this window-like pattern? You can see that between the adjacent mesothelial cell, there is a potential space or a window, okay? And this is called as the window-like pattern or the window-like effect. Now, why the window is there? Now, very importantly, if you see, the surface of the mesothelial cells are having microvilli, okay? And because of the presence of the microvilli, the adjacent uh, mesothelial cells, they cannot oppose uh, you know, tightly with each other. So, always some amount of a space is left and this space is creating what is known as a window. And the presence of the window-like pattern is suggestive of a benign, uh, you know, a cell cluster like a mesothelial cell cluster. Okay, so this is the importance. The window-like pattern is exhibited by benign mesothelial cell clusters. Okay, okay. If you see over here, mesothelial cells can be present singly or they can be present in small clusters. They present as a uniform cell population. Window-like pattern in between the two adjacent cells can be appreciated. These are round cells with round nuclei, with central to eccentric nucleus and prominent nucleoli. They have a well-defined cytoplasmic border, sometimes which can show cytoplasmic outpouchings as well as blebbing. The cytoplasmic borders, as I have already mentioned, they are quite sharp and they usually remain intact. The perinuclear portion of the cytoplasm is usually denser as compared to the periphery. Now, if you compare the size of a mesothelial cell with a lymphocyte, so for comparison, a lymphocyte is present over here. If you compare, the mesothelial cells are larger in size as compared to the lymphocyte and they have more amount of cytoplasm as compared to a lymphocyte. Cytochemically, the mesothelial cells, if you see, they are alcyon blue positive as well as pass positive and immunocytochemistically, they are positive for cal retinin. So, this is how a normal mesothelial cell looks like. Myself, Dr. Gibran Ahmad presents to you Simply Pathology and today we are back with a very important lecture. In this lecture, we are going to start with the effusion cytology and in this part, we are going to cover the non-neoplastic conditions. So, let us begin today's topic of discussion without wasting any more time. So, very importantly, before we start with the effusion cytology, we should understand that there are three important body cavities. The pleural cavity, pericardial cavity and peritoneal cavity. Now, these cavities and the visceral organs, they are lined by a thin layer of mesothelial cells called as the mesothelium. Normally, these cavities, they are collapsed and they contain only a potential space where a very less amount of thin lubricating fluid. Now, the mesothelial layer which is covering the visceral organ is called as the visceral layer of the particular, uh, you know, space. And the outer layer is known as the parietal layer. So, the mesothelial lining of the body cavity has two layers. One which is in close proximity to the visceral organ called as the visceral layer and the one which is on the outer aspect that is called as the parietal layer. For example, each lung in the thoracic cavity is lined by visceral pleura and the potential space is called as the pleural cavity. Now, the outer layer of the pleura is attached to the chest wall and that is called as the parietal pleura. Similarly, the heart is present within a sac that is called as the pericardial sac and most of the abdominal organs are present in another body cavity called as the peritoneal cavity. Now, the peritoneal cavity, if you see, it is the largest serosal sac in our body and it is derived from the seromic cavity of the embryo. It contains about scanty fluid that has lubricant and anti-inflammatory effect. 
Now the visceral organs are covered by a single layer of flat mesothelial cells. The cells rest on fibrovascular connective tissue, blood vessels and nerves. So let me show you the different kinds of body cavity. So number one, we are going to see what is called as the pleural cavity. Okay. So as I told you that there are three important body cavities. Number one, we are going to see the pleural cavity. So as we see over here, so this is the lung. And if you see, basically, there are two layers which is lining this pleural cavity. The number one layer, which is very close to the surface of the lung, this is called basically as the visceral, visceral epithelium. Okay, this is the visceral epithelium, which is very close to the visceral organ, that is the lung. And the second layer, which is the outermost layer, this is called as the parietal layer. This is called as the parietal layer or the parietal epithelium. Okay, now in between these two layers, you are having a potential space which is called as the pleural cavity. It is called as the pleural cavity. Okay, so basically, normally very less amount of, of, of lubricating fluid is present in the pleural cavity. But for example, because of any kind of pathology, there is excessive amount of accumulation of fluid, then the condition is called as pleural effusion. It's a condition wherein fluid accumulates in the pleural space. Okay, so I hope you understand. Now, the second important cavity that we are going to see over here, that is the peritoneal cavity. Now, very importantly, we have to understand that again, just like in the lungs over here also, there are two layers of epithelium. One layer which is surrounding the visceral organ that is called as the visceral peritoneum which is shown in blue over here. So this over here is the visceral peritoneum or the visceral layer or the visceral epithelium which is basically opposed to the viscera. Okay. On the other hand, on the outer aspect, we are having the parietal peritoneum. Okay. We are having the parietal peritoneum or the parietal epithelium, okay, which is on the outer aspect. In between the visceral and the parietal peritoneum, you have a cavity which is called as the peritoneal cavity. Normally, the peritoneal cavity is collapsed and it's a very small potential space containing less amount of lubricating fluid. Now, in this diagram, it is artificially enlarged for illustrative purpose. Okay, normally it is not this much, there is not this much space. So, if there is accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity, we will call it as peritoneal effusion. We will call it as peritoneal effusion. Okay. And lastly, we are having the third important body cavity that is called as the peri cardial space okay this is the pericardial space okay or the pericardial sac now as we can see this is the heart as we can appreciate over here and close to the surface of the heart there is a there is a lining that is the visceral pericardium or the visceral layer of the pericardium okay and on the outer aspect we are having the parietal pericardium okay and in between you are having a space that is called as the pericardial space and if fluid accumulates in this space, we will call it as pericardial effusion. We will call it as pericardial effusion. So these are the three important body cavities. Hope you have understood the concept of parietal and the visceral epithelium. Okay. Now, very importantly, before we start the effusion cytology, we have to clear certain concepts. Okay. Certain hemodynamic principles needs to be clear. Now, this is basically one important vessel. So, this is a one blood vessel over here. Okay. And this is the tissue space. Okay. This is the tissue space. Around the blood vessel, you have the tissue space. Okay. So, normally in a vessel, there are two kinds of pressure which is acting. One is your hydrostatic pressure which is acting outwards and one is your plasma colloid oncotic pressure which is acting inwards. Okay. Now, the hydrostatic pressure is there because of the volume of the fluid present in the blood vessel. Whereas the plasma colloid oncotic pressure is the pressure which is exerted by the plasma proteins which are present in the blood. Okay. So, the hydrostatic pressure is acting outwards whereas the plasma colloid oncotic pressure is acting inwards. So, normally the hydrostatic pressure balances the plasma colloid oncotic pressure with very little net movement of fluid across them. Okay. So, normally very less amount of fluid it comes out of the blood vessel. Okay. And this fluid is entering the tissue space, okay, and that is responsible for the interstitial fluid pressure. Now, this uh, amount of the fluid that is always coming out of the blood vessel is normally drained by the lymphatics and then they are drained finally into the thoracic duct and eventually they enter the left subclavian vein. So, this is how the tissue space normally they are kept dry and normally there is no effusion, okay.
Now, but for example, but for example, in a condition where the hydrostatic pressure increases, okay, increases and the, the colloid osmotic pressure decreases. In such condition, what is going to happen? Excessive amount of fluid is going to come out and accumulate in the interstitial tissue space. If the amount of fluid accumulating in the tissue space is exceeding the capacity of the lymphatic drainage, then it is going to lead to what is called as edema or effusion. Okay, it is going to lead to edema or effusion. So, normally as I have already said that the hydrostatic pressure normally balances the plasma colloid oncotic pressure. And the normal hydrostatic pressure, as I told you, it is because of the volume of the blood in the vessels and it is acting outwards, whereas the normal plasma colloid oncotic pressure is there because of the plasma proteins present in the blood and it is acting inwards. So, very importantly, normally the tissue spaces, they are kept dry with the help of lymphatics. Okay, pressure inside the tissue space is called as interstitial fluid pressure. Now, if the hydrostatic pressure increases because of any cause or the plasma colloidic oncotic pressure is decreasing because of any cause, excessive amount of fluid is going to come out of the vessel and they are going to accumulate in the tissue space, thus increasing the interstitial fluid pressure. And if the amount of fluid exceeds the rate of lymphatic drainage, that is going to lead to edema or effusion, as I have already discussed with you all. Okay. Now, very importantly, we have to understand that this edema fluid or this effusion fluid can be of two types. One is your transudate, one is your exudate. Normally, normally if the fluid which is accumulating is poor in protein, usually they are non-inflammatory and they are called as transudate. And usually transudate a type of effusion occurs because of systemic causes like conditions of heart failure, conditions of liver failure, renal disease or any nutritional disorder. Whereas, if you, if you see that the uh, fluid which has accumulated in the tissue space, if the efficient fluid is rich in the protein, they are called as exudates, okay? And basically over here, uh, you know, this has happened because of some damage to the vessel, vascular wall leading to increased vascular permeability, okay? And usually they are inflammatory in nature, okay? Normally they are localized, okay? Normally the inflammatory, uh, you know, uh, edema fluid is localized in nature except in sepsis wherein we are getting generalized edema okay so let us now try to understand the concept of transudative and exudative effusion so as i told you transudative fluid is caused by the disturbance of the hydrostatic pressure and or the osmotic pressure okay colloid osmotic oncotic pressure now very important thing is that the wall of the blood vessels in transudative effusion is intact okay the common causes of transudate are systemic causes like congestive heart failure cirrhosis of the liver and renal failure so in the transudative fluid remember that the specific gravity is low because the amount of solute is less it is less than 1.015 the amount of protein is low so they have a low protein content and they have a scanty cellularity now the cells in transudate they are usually your mesothelial cells they are usually your mesothelial cells and occasionally lymphocytes and polymorphs might be present as well so always remember that the blood vessel is always intact in case of transudative effusion and transudative effusion is basically taking secondary to systemic causes like heart failure cirrhosis of the liver or renal failure Coming to the exudative effusion, as I told you, it is caused when there is a damage to the wall of the blood vessels or damage to the wall of the blood capillaries which are lining the mesothelium. This damage of the capillaries may occur because of inflammation or by direct damage by malignant cells. The common causes of transudative effusions include infections, collagen vascular disease and malignancy. Now, exudative effusion, because they are containing a high amount of protein, they have a high specific gravity of more than 1.015, high protein content of more than 3 grams per deciliter or 3 grams per 100 ml, high lactate dehydrogenase content, then they are high in fibrin and rich in cells. Okay, They have increased amount of cellularity. Malignancy usually causes exudative effusion by damaging the wall of the blood vessels. However, the tumor may block the lymphatic channels by pressure effect and may cause transudative effusion as well. So, any kind of malignant effusion can occur mainly by exudative, uh, you know, effusion because of damage to the blood vessels directly by the malignant cells or sometimes such malignant cells can lead to blockage of the lymphatic channels and therefore they can lead to transudative effusion as well.
Okay, so transudative effusion. Remember, most commonly these are occurring when the hydrostatic pressure increases. Okay, increased hydrostatic pressure, for example, as in your heart failure conditions. Okay, or when the osmotic pressure is going down. For example, in liver diseases or in renal failure condition where there is loss of excessive uh, loss of plasma proteins in the urine. Okay, or in liver conditions where the synthesis of plasma protein is reduced. Okay, because of liver failure. So the causes of of transudative and exudative effusion should be very clear to everyone. Okay. Now, now very importantly, yes, this is the same chart as we have seen. So how do you differentiate between a transudative and exudative? It's a very important viva exam question. Also, it is asked as a short note in the exam. So if you see the transudative fluid, they have less amount of protein, so usually they are clear. Whereas the exudate, they are turbid. The specific gravity is less than 1.015. The specific gravity is more. The protein content of transudate is less than 3 gram per deciliter, whereas it is above 3 gram per deciliter in exudate. The fibrin content is low and they do not coagulate, whereas the fibrin content is high and it coagulates if they, if is kept. That is why always you should check for the presence of coagulum. Okay, you should check for the presence of coagulum in the efficient fluid. The LDH content is low in transudate, whereas it is high in exudate. The cellularity is quite scanty and less in transudate, whereas the exudate is rich in cells. And the significance is a transudative fluid rarely contains malignant cells, whereas an exudative fluid often contains malignant cells. Okay. okay. So let us first see whenever you are receiving a sample of fluid, okay, in your lab or in your hospital or in your college, then what is what are the steps that you should take? So the number one step is to write down the details of the patient. Okay, you should write the name of the patient, the age and sex of the patient, from which ward the sample has been received, and also what kind of fluid you have received, whether it is a pleural fluid, whether it is a ascitic fluid, whether it is a pericardial fluid, or whether it is a CSF sample. So whatever is the nature of the fluid, you have to you know write down what kind of fluid it is. After writing out that, you should write down the volume of the fluid. You should write down the exact amount of fluid that you have received. Whether it is 30 ml, 40 ml, 50 ml, 100 ml, whatever is the amount, you should exactly measure it and you should write it down. Then you have to appreciate what is the color. Okay. Remember that transudative fluid is usually light straw colored. Transudative fluid is usually light straw colored. Okay. Now, blood tinged fluid are usually reddish in color. The gross presence of blood may be due to direct trauma to the vessels during collection of fluid or it might indicate malignancy as well. Chylus fluid is milky in color that is usually noted in lymphatic obstruction. Dark brown fluid might occur because of an old hemorrhage. Chocolate brown fluid is noted in case of malignant melanoma. So, the color of the fluid that you have received might give you an insight into the nature of the fluid that you are dealing with. Okay. Now, the gross appearance of the specimen also very important thing is that you should see whether the fluid is completely clear or it is cloudy, cloudy, hazy or whether any coagulum is present. So, you should note whether any coagulum is present or not. You should see what is the appearance, whether it is clear or whether it is cloudy, whether it is hazy or it is slightly hazy. So, depending on the content or depending on what the content looks like. For example, usually the transudative fluid, if you see, they are clear. Okay. Whereas, if you look at a purulent effusion, for example, there is, you know, pneumonia and, uh, you know, you have a purulent content. So, it will be completely cloudy and hazy. Okay, thus cloudy and hazy appearance is indicative of whether, you know, it is indicative of, you know, more of an exudative nature of the effusion. Now, the consistency, viscosity of the fluid may give an important information. Fluid in mesothelioma is rich in hyaluronic acid and may have increased consistency like honey. Thick gelatinous consistency of fluid is seen particularly in pseudomyxoma peritonei. Now, any unusual smell of the fluid should be noted as well. So, these initial, you know, important workup is very, very important, okay? Because this might give you an insight about the nature of the trans, uh, of the efficient fluid, okay? So, as we can appreciate over here, this is the first, okay? This is blood tinged, okay? Blood tinged fluid either indicates that there is a traumatic tap or there is malignancy. Then, this is a chylus effusion. You can see the milky nature. The chylus effusion, okay? milky nature might be because of lymphatic obstruction. Now, this is the classical appearance of pale, straw-colored, straw-colored clear fluid, okay. Usually, these are transudates, these are transudates, okay. These are transudates, these are transudates, okay. 
okay next if you can appreciate over here this is the purulent fluid okay this is the purulent aspirate purulent fluid okay so this is basically exudative in nature they are exudative and they are indicative of infections they are indicative of infections okay so after you have seen and you have jot down all the details okay that you have come across then you have to go for processing the sample so very importantly the specimen collection usually the pathologists do not collect the specimen the, spe the specimens are collected by the clinicians and they are sent to the lab for investigation so collection of the effusion fluid from thoracic cavity pericardial and peritoneal cavity is known as thoracocentesis pericardiocentesis and paracentesis respectively okay so at a time remember while you are performing uh, you know uh, uh, thoracocentesis you should not draw more than 1.5 liter of fluid from the pleural cavity as this may cause a rebound phenomenon and development of pneumothorax by contrast large volume of paracentesis up to 4 to 6 liters is relatively safe now the efficient fluid should be collected in a clean container now usually it is preferred to collect the fluid in anticoagulant solution in the ratio of 9 is to 1 that is 9 amount of fluid with 1 amount of the anticoagulant that is ammonium oxalate however in most of the laboratories if you see and even in our college okay we prefer fresh sample without any anticoagulant if necessary efficient fluid can be kept in the refrigerator at 4 degrees for several days a few books say that you can store the sample for one week and few of them they say that you can even store it for two weeks okay so i prefer to use the term for uh, you know for at four degrees centigrade for few days okay under any circumstance the fluid should not be frozen and over here i am only talking about the pleural fluid or pericardial fluid or acidic fluid i am not talking about the csf over here okay csf has to be examined very soon preferably within two hours of collection because the cells rapidly degenerate in a csf sample okay now if you look at the processing how are you going to process the sample so suppose you have received a sample you have taken down all the details so the first thing that you have to do the specimen of the fluid should be shaken before you process so that the cells are well dispersed now very importantly you have to understand so whenever you are receiving the fluid from pathological point of view you have to carry out microscopic examination number one and you have to do the cell count okay you have to do the cell count and you have to do the microscopic examination for the cell type okay so very importantly how we are carrying out the cell count we are going to understand that okay in the end of the lecture but first very importantly we have to understand how do we carry out the microscopic examination for carrying out cytological evaluation okay so first we will see how that how we are going to do the microscopic examination for the cell type so the specimen of the fluid should be shaken well before processing so that the cells are well dispersed around 50 ml of fluid is centrifuged okay now put the fluid sample in a clean airtight centrifuge tube and you have to rotate the tube at 1500 rpm for 10 minutes now remember this value is given in the book okay whereas in our laboratory we are spinning it for around 5 to 7 minutes only okay why we are doing it because we don't want you know the breakdown of these cells okay so add 1500 rpm for 5 to 7 minutes similarly in your institute okay you go and see that at what rpm and for what duration that they are ru running and try to you know see each of these steps and learn each of these steps from the medical technologies that is working in your hospital so this is very important so that you know the working you know how you are preparing or how the process is taking place so for example if you are going in a new lab and if for example you know you don't know about these technical aspects then you will never be able to catch you know what went wrong and which step was wrong okay so you should understand that you should rotate the tube at 1500 rpm for 5 to 7 minutes preferably if you rotate at a higher rpm it might damage the cell now once you have centrifuged okay so this is a centrifuge tube okay so this is the cell button the cell is over here and and this is the supernatant fluid which is on top and over here the cell button is there okay so very importantly you have to make sure that you discard you discard and you throw the supernatant okay you discard and you throw the supernatant now from the sediment which is there left after centrifugation you have to make three to four smears so what are the smears that is must very important that you should make very important mgg smear okay mgg staining should be done 
very important pap staining has to be done pap is very very important if you have not gone through the basic cytology video please go through my basic cytology video wherein you will understand what is the importance of mgg and what is the importance of pap pap is very very important especially when you want to evaluate for any malignant cell because the nuclear features are very crystal clear in your pap okay so one air dried smear for mgg stain and three alcohol fixed smears for pap stain are to be used along with that for example if they have asked you to carry out some special staining for afb acid fast bacillus so we have to carry out zn staining so similarly extra unstained smears has to be kept for any special staining so this is the routine procedure and you should ask the medical technologist whenever they are preparing any of these slides for cytological evaluation they have to prepare mgg along with the pap okay especially for fluid evaluation pap is a must okay now this is the centrifuge machine i am sure you must have seen this centrifuge machine okay now there are certain other investigations that you can also carry out with the efficient cytology sample one of them is your cell block now it is always advisable to make a cell block from the residual sample now the residual sediment is treated with plasma which is followed by drops of thrombin the sample is clotted and the clot is fixed in 10% buffered formalin for 30 minutes now the fixed clot is wrapped in the filter paper and it is then processed okay as we do the normal histopathology processing okay for your biopsies or for your smaller specimens okay now what is the advantages of cell block now what is cell block i'll just tell you so for example okay this is the sediment okay so you take some amount of sediment okay you take some amount of sediment over here and to this mixture you are adding plasma and you add thrombin now the basic process of adding the 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 rational behind adding the plasma and the thrombin plasma is providing you the clotting factors and thrombin is going to stimulate the process of clotting so as a result a clot will be formed and in this particular clot what is going to happen that whatever cells which were present as a sediment they are going to get trapped so this basically this basically clot that is formed it is providing basically you know it is replicating a solid tissue so we can fix this particular uh, you know clot that is formed that is going to become hard and then we can go for the normal paraffin embedding so that a you know paraffin embedded uh, you know uh, 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 cell block is formed and over here then we can cut thin thin sections and then we can examine them just like any histopathology slide so cell block is allowing us to perform special stain it can be used for immunocytochemistry because multiple slides can be made from the block now once the block is made it can be preserved as well so the tissues can be kept as ar archival material for future use now morphological comparison with histopathology section is also possible as the cell block is enmeshing all the cells in the clot so that chances of detection of malignancy is very high in a cell block so cell block is one of the methods of processing the effusion sample it cannot be done routinely but if possible we should carry this process routinely so this is what it is this is a sample media we have done the centrifugation and we have got the the sediment the supernatant has to be discarded you did the de decant okay then some of them you are preparing you are using it for preparing the mgg and the pap smear with the remaining amount of the sediment that is there you add plasma and the thrombin and this is going to help in the formation of clot and to that particular clotted uh, you know sample uh, or the clotted thing you keep it in 10% for a uh, buffered formalin for fixation and after that you just process it and make the paraffin embedded block okay like this okay you just give it for tissue processing so ultimately you are getting a paraffin embedded you know a uh, 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 formalin fixed uh, you know uh, block and that can be subjected to histopathological evaluation we can do the hne staining over there and you know we can uh, you know uh, use we can also store that particular material for archival use just like any histopathology slide now the other investigation that you can do using the efficient fluid sample is you can carry out flow cytometry if it is necessary the residual fluid can be used for dna flow cytometry and dual color flow cytometry as well as we can carry out liquid based uh, you know preparation can be done now as the efficient fluid is in the liquid media so it is not necessary to keep the sample for lbc however lbc may yield good cellularity and the cells are spread in a smaller area if we carry out liquid based preparation okay okay now very importantly now we are going to start with the benign cell population now it is very very important for you to understand the normal uh, you know benign cell population that we see 
in a particular fluid why because 90 to 95 percent of the times whatever fluid you are receiving it is going to be reported as benign okay and they will not have any malignancy so it is very important to understand this benign cell population else you are going to over interpret and make a mistake while interpreting a particular uh, you know fluid so the benign cell population in effusion so remember in non cancerous conditions due to the chronic irritation of the mesothelial lined surfaces varying degrees of mesothelial cell proliferation will occur the exfoliated mesothelial cells often demonstrate changes that may be confused for malignancy these benign mesoepithelial uh, mesothelial cells will be referred as the reactive mesothelial cells the very very important thing is in non neoplastic or in non cancerous conditions because of chronic irritation there will be exfoliation of certain mesothelial cells which will have certain characteristics and these benign mesothelial cells are referred to as the reactive mesothelial cells now remember that the benign effusion fluid they contain different types of cells okay consisting of the mesothelial cells macrophages lymphocytes polymorphs eosinophils etc so we will see each one of them in details okay so first the most important cell that we have to appreciate in an if in, in a uh, efficient fluid is the presence of the mesothelial cells now the mesothelial cells are the most common cells which are noted in any kind of effusion so irrespective of the cause of the effusion okay any kind of effusion will contain the mesothelial cells irrespective of the cause now the cells are shedded from the visceral or the parietal lining and they freely proliferate in the effusion fluid therefore the mesothelial cells may often show reactive changes and they might simulate the malignant cells and therefore it is very very important to recognize these reactive mesothelial cells because they are coming in the differential diagnosis for malignancy the mesothelial cells in smear are usually present discreetly or as small monolayer clusters the individual cells are round to oval very important the cells are round to oval with moderate amount of cytoplasm and central to eccentric nucleus so if this is the mesothelial cell they are round either the nucleus is present at the center or the nucleus might be present little bit on the outer aspect that is eccentric this is basically eccentric the nucleus shows very mild nuclear polymorphism or pleomorphism smooth contour and uniformly granular chromatin so the chromatin if you see it is uniformly granular and you can also appreciate readily visible nucleoli so in reactive mesothelial cells the nucleoli is readily visible not only this mesothelial cells often show binucleation multinucleation nuclear pleomorphism and multiple prominent nucleoli however the nuclei of the cells do not show marked atypia and these cells often attach to other mesothelial cells that give indication of their mesothelial origin therefore the interpretation of efficient cytology smear should be carefully done and overall cellular background and clinical history should be given more importance now very importantly the groups of mesothelial cells often show a window like space in between the cells this is due to the long slender microvilli on the surface of the cells that can be demonstrated ultra structurally so what is this window like space i will demonstrate you with the help of a diagram so don't worry about that now remember if an effusion is there for a very long period of time long standing effusion may cause the formation of small to large vacuoles within the cytoplasm of the mesothelial cells at times the vacuoles may be quite large and may push the nucleus to the periphery giving a signet ring appearance and we all know that the signet ring appearance usually is seen in some kinds of malignancy so over here also we can make a mistake so this is a diagnostic pitfall again now the benign mesothelial cells with signet ring appearance should be distinguished from the malignant cells which are also having a signet ring appearance and the most important factor in the differentiation is the nuclear morphology okay which is very important to differentiate the signet cell appearance of mesothelial cells from that of malignant cells absolutely the signet ring cell appearance uh, you know of the malignant cells the malignant cell nuclei will be highly pleomorphic compared to the benign mesothelial cell nucleus so these are the characteristic mesothelial cells as we can appreciate now these mesothelial cells are present in small cluster as you can already see in this particular diagram okay now very importantly if you see an individual uh, mesothelial cell they are round and the nucleus is also round and if you see the nucleus is central to eccentrically placed it is shifted to one side okay 
Also, one very important thing, if you can appreciate the cytoplasmic border, if you see, they are quite sharply defined. Okay, and if you see the perinuclear cytoplasm, that is the cytoplasm which is uh, just uh, surrounding the nucleus, they are quite dense compared to the outer pale cytoplasm. Okay, not only that, you can see certain prominent nucleoli as well. Now, sometimes within an individual mesothelial cell can so multinucleation, which is having two to three nucleus. So, multinucleation in a mesothelial cell is quite frequent and easily seen. And sometimes if you see the cytoplasm is also showing cytoplasmic blebs as we can appreciate over here. Now, one very important feature that is demonstrated by the cluster of mesothelial cells is what is known as the window phenomenon or window-like pattern. Now, what is this window-like pattern? You can see that between the adjacent mesothelial cells, there is a potential space or a window. Okay, and this is called as the window-like pattern or the window-like effect. Now, why the window is there? Now, very importantly, if you see, the surface of the mesothelial cells are having microvilli. Okay, and because of the presence of the microvilli, the adjacent uh, mesothelial cells, they cannot oppose uh, you know, tightly with each other. So, always some amount of a space is left and this space is creating what is known as a window. And the presence of the window-like pattern is suggestive of a benign, popular, uh, you know, a cell cluster like a mesothelial cell cluster. Okay, so this is the importance. The window-like pattern is exhibited by benign mesothelial cell clusters. Okay, okay. If you see over here, mesothelial cells can be present singly or they can be present in small clusters. They present as a uniform cell population. Window-like pattern in between the two adjacent cells can be appreciated. These are round cells with round nuclei, with central to eccentric nucleus and prominent nucleoli. They have a well-defined cytoplasmic border, sometimes which can show cytoplasmic outpouchings as well as blebbing. The cytoplasmic borders, as I have already mentioned, they are quite sharp and they usually remain intact. The perinuclear portion of the cytoplasm is usually denser as compared to the periphery. Now, if you compare the size of a mesothelial cell with a lymphocyte, so for comparison, a lymphocyte is present over here. If you compare, the mesothelial cells are larger in size as compared to the lymphocyte and they have more amount of cytoplasm as compared to a lymphocyte. Cytochemically, the mesothelial cells, if you see, they are alcyon blue positive as well as pass positive and immunocytochemistically, they are positive for cal retinin. So, this is how a normal mesothelial cell looks like. Now, in this diagram, what we can appreciate that the mesothelial cell, they can either be present singly or they can be present as small and very loose, co loosely cohesive clusters. Okay. So, very important that the mesothelial cells, they are arranged in loosely cohesive uh, groups in contrast to tight groups, which are seen only in case of malignancies. Now, over here, we can see that <clears throat> the mesothelial cells, they are present as a sheet. Okay, we can see a sheet of mesothelial cells. Now, this is the peritoneal washing, which is negative for malignancy. The mesothelial cells can be seen arranged in a flat sheet. Now, why we are seeing the mesothelial cells in the form of a flat sheet? Now, when the mesothelial cells are aspirated during a surgical procedure as in a peritoneal washing, they are more commonly found in sheets, presumably as a result of their forceful detachment from the serosal surface. And one very important thing that we can appreciate over here in this cluster is the presence of this window phenomenon. Okay, so in between the cells, there is a space and they are loosely bound to each other, okay, because of the presence of surface microvilli. So, the presence of this window effect is uh, suggestive of a mesothelial cell population and it indicates benign nature. Now, very importantly, in this particular diagram also, what we can appreciate is the nature of the individual mesothelial cells. So, if these cells, if we can appreciate, these are the lymphocytes, okay, that we can appreciate. If you see over here, very importantly, this is how a classical mesothelial cell looks like, okay. So, if you see over here, okay, they are round. And if you look at the nucleus, which is also round, okay. And very importantly, the cytoplasm is there, which is very well defined. And most importantly, the perinuclear cytoplasm is much darker as compared to the paler outer cytoplasm. Again, over here, we can appreciate. Again, in this diagram, what we can appreciate? Yes, what is this phenomenon called as? This is the window phenomenon, which is seen classically in this loosely cohesive cluster of mesothelial cell. Okay.
again in this particular diagram this is the high power view wherein we can appreciate the individual discretely present mesothelial cells so all of these these are the mesothelial cells which are present discretely okay what are these these are the lymphocytes okay these are the lymphocytes what are these these are the polymorphs okay these are the polymorphs so we can see the different kinds of cells over here okay so very importantly you have to recognize the presence of the mesothelial cells okay characteristic appearance of mesothelial cells with round cells with round nucleus with eccentrically placed nucleus now, very importantly, this is again one pap smear uh, wherein we can see a mesothelial cell group. Now, what we are wanting to show over here, there is a monolayered cell sheet, okay? And this cell sheet, if you see, they are showing the window phenomenon again over here, okay? So, this is again a window phenomenon that we can appreciate over here. So, the microvilli prevents the adjacent mesothelial cells from opposing the cell borders, thus creating mesothelial windows. As I've already told you, the reason for the presence of mesothelial windows, you can see the individual lymphocytes over here, which is also present and you can compare the size with the individual mesothelial cell, okay? So, the mesothelial cells are larger in size as compared to the lymphocytes. Again, as I told you, very long-standing, you know, effusions, okay, they can, uh, you know, uh, you know, there can be development of cytoplasmic vacuoles as we can appreciate over here. This is individual mesothelial cells, which is showing the presence of cytoplasmic vacuolation, okay. So, we can see the reactive mesothelial cells with slightly eccentric nuclei, which shows two zones with peripheral vacuolation, okay, peripheral vacuolation can be seen. These are the mesothelial cells, okay. Very importantly, this is a polymorph. This is again a polymorph. These are the lymphocytes as we can appreciate in this particular diagram. Now, this is again an acytic fluid. Now, why have I shown this particular uh, chart or this particular diagram? Because we can see individual mesothelial cells which is in the form of signet ring appearance. Signet ring cell appearance. Again over here, this is there is again a signet ring cell appearance. Now, what is very important, we have to understand that signet cell appearance can be seen in many kinds of malignancies. So, we have to differentiate the signet cell appearance which is seen in malignancies versus the signet cell appearance which we see in, in the benign mesothelial cells. Okay. So, the only way to differentiate is looking at the nucleus. Now, the nucleus in case of the mesothelial cells showing the signet cell appearance will be quite bland and they are, you know, very less or they are mildly pleomorphic. Whereas, the nucleus uh, of malignant signet ring cells, if you see, they are quite pleomorphic in nature, okay? They are quite pleomorphic in nature and therefore they are malignant. So, over here, this is the acytic fluid which is negative for malignancy. So, there is an isolated cell pattern as well as the nucleus is having a bland chromatin. Because the chromatin is quite bland, bland and benign looking, therefore they are negative for malignancy. So, such signet ring cells, they are actually mesothelial cells which has which is long-standing reactive and which contains a large amount of cytoplasmic vacuoles which has pushed the bland looking nucleus towards the periphery, thus giving this particular signet ring cell appearance. So, over here we can see the large vacuole. So, this is a large vacuole over here which has displaced the nucleus to the periphery resembling the signet ring cells. Okay. So, over here we can again see one large vacuole which has pushed the nucleus towards the periphery. So, why such change occurs? Long-standing effusion may so show such cells. So, we can see the round cells with abundant vacuolated cytoplasm and peripherally pushed nucleus. Now, nuclear morphology is very helpful in distinguishing the character of such cells. So, if the nuclear morphology is bland, then they are basically benign mesothelial cells. But if the nuclear morphology is bad, okay, so they are hyperchromatic, pleomorphic nucleus with high NC ratio, in that situation, okay, it is basically indicative of indication of a malignancy, okay. So, which are the malignancies which show signet ring cells? So, malignancies which show signet ring cells are the signet ring carcinoma of the stomach, breast carcinoma, ovarian adenocarcinoma and therapy related changes might also show such signet ring cell appearance. Okay. Now, what are the differential diagnosis of a mesothelial cell? So, number one differential diagnosis are the histiocytes or the macrophages. Mesothelial cells are difficult to distinguish from the macrophages or the histiocytes. Now, usually the macrophages, they often contain phagocytosed material in the cytoplasm. The nucleus of the macrophages, they are central in position with indistinct nucleoli, whereas the nucleus of the, uh, 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 the, nucleus of the um, uh, uh, mesothelial cells, they are round and they are usually eccentric and they have a prominent nucleoli. 
if we look at the mesothelioma over here so this is the second important differential diagnosis of mesothelioma that is how you should differentiate the mesothelial uh, uh, cells from the malignant cells of mesothelioma so the malignant mesothelial cells may simulate reactive mesothelial cells now the mesothelioma cells are in large groups okay with moderate nuclear pleomorphism whereas nuclear pleomorphism in benign mesothelial cells is quite mild okay and whereas in mesothelioma there is moderate nuclear pleomorphism and they often show macronuclei there is macronuclei okay now the clinical history of asbestos exposure rapidly developing effusion mass lesion near the mesothelial surface they all are suggestive of a malignant mesothelial cell suggestive of mesothelioma okay this is very very important to understand so how do you differentiate the reactive mesothelial cells from the malignant cells of mesothelioma first of all if you look at the cell cluster of a reactive mesothelial cell they are small and loosely adhesive whereas that for mesothelioma they are present in large clusters of cells more than 10 to 12 cells forming clusters the cell size is small in reactive mesothelial cells whereas they are relatively large in mesothelioma mild nuclear pleomorphism is seen in reactive mesothelial cells whereas moderate to mark pleomorphism can be seen in the malignant cells of mesothelioma and the nucleoli which is present is a small whereas macronuclei is present in mesothelioma there are large nuclei which is present so this is how you will differentiate between a reactive mesothelial cells from the malignant cells of a mesothelioma okay now while you are interpreting a mesothelial cell population so what are the things you should keep in mind whenever you are examining a mesothelial cell you should not over interpret the nuclear atypia of mesothelial cell okay very importantly appropriate importance should be given to the clinical details of the patient and the background cellular details such as the presence of intense inflammation you should not interpret a compromised smear remember a two cell population usually indicates malignancy okay when you are seeing two types of cells okay then that is indicating malignancy intense mesothelial cell hyperplasia can be seen in cirrhosis uremia as well as in pulmonary infarct now remember a typical mesothelial cell terminology should be avoided and such terminology or such reports should comprise less than 5% of all the reports that is left by a particular lab okay of your reporting okay so a typical mesothelial cell terminology should be avoided because it doesn't provide any uh information nice information to the clinicians okay so they cannot work with this information so as i told you the number one differential diagnosis of the mesothelial cells is the the macrophages or the histiocytes so now we are going to see the next so we have already read about the mesothelial cells now we are going to understand about the next importance you know benign cell that is the macrophages or the histiocytes histiocytes are almost invariably present in all sorts of effusion fluid the number of histiocytes in effusion fluid varies in case of chronic infection the number of macrophages or histiocytes may be increased now the histiocytes are usually present as dispersed population of cells however occasionally they might form loose aggregates as well so if you look at this particular diagram over here this you can appreciate okay this is the characteristic mesothelial cell so characteristically there is a round cell round nuclei with eccentrically placed nucleus as we can appreciate okay these are all the mesothelial cells some of them they are also showing cytoplasmic vacuolation that is also all right okay now very importantly you can see one cell over here okay what is this cell this is classically a histiocyte or a macrophage the cytoplasm if you see they, it is quite foamy in nature and the shape of the nucleus is basically kidney shaped usually they are central but sometimes they might be eccentric as well but they are not round nucleus okay and most commonly okay the cytoplasm of the phagocytes or the macrophages they will contain some phagocytic debris in their cytoplasm okay and very importantly most of the times they are present singly they are not present in clusters like for example mesothelial cells they are forming a cluster and they are present whereas they are present singly over here now if i ask you what are these cells which is present what are these other other cells which is present over here yes this is again a lymphocyte and this is again a polymorph again this is this is again a polymorph that we can appreciate over here so if you look at the comparison of the mesothelial cells from the macrophages if you look at the cell arrangement the mesothelial cells okay there is clusters of cells which shows window pattern whereas macrophages okay no such clusters are there and no window phenomenon can be seen 
the cytoplasm is vacuolated sometimes in mesothelial cells whereas over here their cytoplasm is foamy containing phagocytosed material the cytoplasmic margin if you see they are quite well defined over here in case of mesothelial cells whereas for the histiocyte they are ill defined and the cytoplasm you know it tends to blend with the background the nucleus is eccentric in mesothelial cells whereas it is central in macrophages the nucleus shape is round in case of mesothelial cells whereas they are kidney shaped and indented over here in the macrophages the nucleoli they are small and conspicuous whereas the nucleoli are indistinct in case of macrophages this is how you have to differentiate a mesothelial cell from a histiocyte let me show you another diagram as well so over here also you can see these binucleated mesothelial cells mononucleated mesothelial cells but if you see over here this one is a classical histiocyte this is a classical histiocyte that we can appreciate over here look at the foamy cytoplasm and look at the kidney shaped nucleus that is present over here okay so macrophages in comparison to the mesothelial cells they are larger than the mesothelial cells and they contain a bean shaped nuclei as we appreciate over here now what are the other blood cells that we can see in the efficient fluid so we have already seen and i have shown you them we can see the polymorph so scanty number of polymorph for nuclear leukocyte is invariably present in the effusion fluid however a large number of neutrophilic leukocytes are seen mainly in purulent effusion for example in early stages of pneumonia so the causes of purulent effusion are mainly acute infection and infarction okay there is acute infection and infarction lymphocytes the presence of lymphocytes is extremely common in effusion the predominant population of lymphocytes is seen in any chronic infection such as tuberculosis chylus effusion and infiltration by a lymphoma lymphocytes are polyclonal in origin however most of the lymphocytes are t cell type okay they are t cell type eosinophils if you see the term eosinophilic effusion is labeled when the predominant population of cells more than 50% cells in effusion is eosinophil eosinophils are seen in a variety of effusion such as allergic condition parasitic infection pulmonary infarct pulmonary tuberculosis malignancies and spontaneous pneumothorax in certain cases no specific cause of effusion may be found and this may be due to idiopathic eosinophilic effusion then the presence of mast cells now the presence of mast cell is not rare in effusion fluid these are mononuclear cells with blotchy purple colored metachromatic granules in cytoplasm in mgg stain these cells are not recognizable in pap stain now samoma bodies now remember samoma bodies if you remember it is a type of dystrophic calcification these are nothing but concentric laminated dark blue calcified material which is known as samoma bodies and sometimes they might be seen in effusion fluid samoma body is usually related with metastatic papillary adenocarcinoma of the ovary or certain other papillary carcinomas okay however remember one important thing the presence of samoma body does not always indicate malignancy it may be noted in benign effusion also okay so these things have to be kept in mind while you are reporting a fluid this is a peritoneal washing which is negative for malignancy now this is the classical you know uh, the samoma bodies that we see okay now in this case the samoma bodies were present but there was no malignancy detected in the patient so what does it it tell us it tell us that the presence of samoma bodies alone does not necessarily indicate a neoplastic process now melanin containing cell cells with dark brown melanin containing pigment may be noted in effusion with malignant melanoma hemosiderin leaden crystals golden brown hemosiderin leaden macrophages may be seen in chronic hemorrhagic effusion as well now we are going to see the different kinds of non neoplastic conditions and we are going to see with the help of diagram that how they look like so it is going to help us in our interpretation of the diagnosis so in case of tuberculous effusion two things might happen 